lovely to see you here. Those of you who are visitors, lovely to see you. Pray that you'll enjoy and be blessed as we worship the Lord together. It is uh, our monthly all-age service this morning, so it's more interactive and things to do uh, with, the, with the youngsters. Um, just makes me wonder, is this what we normally do? Um, in one way it is, in another way it isn't. Welcome to you all. Our songs and our singing this morning is going to be led by our young people. So young people, come and uh, come up to the front here. Get yourselves sorted out every Friday. Uh, they're here and they're practicing and they've, uh, they're going to bless us. We're going to be blessed as they lead us in our worship this morning. We are really grateful for them, for all they do and for the time they put into it and uh, for summoning up their courage to lead us this morning. It's great. Isn't it great to have such a gr lovely group of young people? Let's encourage them as we sing. We're going to sing two songs, um, Blessed Be Your Name, and then Daniel's just going to lead us in a word of prayer before we move into sing 10,000 Reasons. So let's stand and be ready for worship. Thank you. 
Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you that we can gather here together. I thank you for each person here by, who by your grace have the freedom to worship you when so many believers are sadly not able to. Lord, I also thank you for Youth Band and for Orlando, Amy, Justin and Joe who help to train the youth in worshiping you through the art of music. Lord, we all are sinners, but you gave us the ability com to converse with you. So Lord, I ask you to provide for our needs, especially Christians who are being persecuted for their faith and those living through the war, this war in Ukraine and anyone struggling financially, no matter what country they may, may be in. Lord, we pray for you to give them strength. Finally, I ask you to open our hearts and minds as we hear your word preached to us. Young and old alike, may we accept you into our hearts. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So this morning we're going to think about someone who was used to giving orders. So children, I don't know if you like being told what to do. You say I get told what to do all the time. 
parents and school, grown-ups. This is a, perhaps an even harder question for us. How many of us like being told what to do? How many of us like receiving orders? Hmm. So we're going to have a little game of Simon Says to start with this morning, and we'll see who, how we get on uh, doing orders. Uh, well, doing orders, receiving orders, listening, and doing what we're told. So who would like to, I would like some children to come, and I'd really like it if we had one or two grown-ups who were brave enough to come and join me up the front here or along here, and we'll do a little game of Simon Says. Who's going to come and help me with Simon Says? Come on, Samuel, come on. Anybody else? Come on, Caleb. Any grown-ups going to be brave enough to just do Simon Says? Or it could be I could get everybody to, no, I wouldn't do that. Right. Ah. Oh. Well, I'll tell you, while you're here, Martin, <laughs> come on, Ted and Ivy. You can come as well. Are you coming? And Dragon Lily. <laughs> Dragon. Um, Ivy. Name's gone blank. Annie, Annie Rose. Yeah, right. So I need you to come, come this way. Come and stand across here. Have we got any adults going to brave this or not? Ah. Oh. Ah, oh, come on, Mum. Come on. Well done. Great. Right. So you know, you know how we do Simon Says. Okay? It is if Simon says something, you have to do it. If Simon doesn't say, you don't do it. Okay? So you have to listen to a little practice. So Simon says, put your hand in the air. Simon says, put your other hand in the air. Take them down. Right. So you only do it if Simon says. That was a little practice. Right. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can catch you out. With allowances, I think, for the youngest members of our team this morning. So, uh, right. Okay. Simon says, walk on the spot. Simon says, run on the spot and walk on the spot. Good, Gally, you keep going. Put your hands in the air. Simon says, put your hands in the air. Simon says, stop running on the spot. Simon says, put your left hand in the air. Simon, didn't, Simon says, didn't say, didn't say, stop rubbing your tummy. Ted, you're out. So keep rubbing your tummy. Simon says, keep rubbing your tummy. Right, okay, stop rubbing your tummy. Uh, Annie, <laughs> Ivy, you, st you stop momentarily. Right, Simon says, pat your head and can keep, keep tapping your tummy. <sighs> keep rubbing your tummy. And Simon says, tap your head at the same time. That's quite hard, isn't it? Okay, stop rubbing your tummy. Ah, <laughs> you're out. <laughs> right, okay. And we've, still, we've got two, two girls left, right. Oh, you love this, don't you, Annie Rose? Right, okay. Uh, did Simon say that you could stop? No, he didn't, did he? So you're out. We have a winner. Well done. Okay. I won't put you through it again. Well done. Just a little bit of fun. Just, just thinking about taking orders. So the story today is about a, a Roman soldier. He was in charge of a lot of men. So he was used to giving orders to people. And he was used to people doing what he said, a bit like Simon in Simon Says Is. And we're going to learn what happened to him when he met Jesus one day. So this story, this account, is in the Gospel of Luke in the Bible, chapter 7. And we're going to watch a video that will tell us the story, first of all. Now, as we do quite often, I need you to listen and watch really carefully because there will be some questions that come afterwards. And we've very conveniently got the building, the room split into four today. I've got eight questions, so there'll be two questions for each section. You've drawn a short straw over here. You can get some extras if you want. I'll give you a clue. There are no watching questions because quite often I'll say you need to watch so you're looking for colours and places. You haven't got to do it. It's just listening today, all right? So it's just listening. I'm going to ask you questions on the story as we go through. Okay, let's watch the story, shall we? Jesus was a bit of a celebrity, and everywhere he went, people wanted to see him because they knew that around Jesus, amazing things happened. As Jesus entered Capernaum, one such person who wanted to see Jesus was a centurion. 
Now this centurion wasn't one of the people from God's nation. He was in fact a Roman soldier. God's people didn't usually like the Roman soldiers, but this soldier was no ordinary soldier. He was a centurion, which meant that he was in charge of a hundred soldiers. He was very important and the people loved him. He built their synagogue and loved the nation of Israel. And because he was an important soldier, he had servants. He had people under him who did whatever he wanted. Whenever he told them to do something, they did it. In fact, the soldier was someone who was in control. But one day his servant became sick. In fact, he became so sick that his servant was lying at home in terrible pain, unable to move. The centurion was in control of a lot of things, but he certainly wasn't in control of sickness. And so he sent messengers to the man he knew really was in control. He sent messengers to see Jesus. The messengers said, Jesus, this man is a good man. He deserves this. Come and please help his servant. Well, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus cared and wanted to help. So he went with him to heal the man. But the centurion knew how Jesus was really in control. And he knew also how unworthy he was to have Jesus come into his house. And so he said to his friends, go and say this to Jesus. Lord, I'm not good enough for you to come into my house. I know I have authority. I tell soldiers what to do but I know you have greater authority. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. The centurion knew he had control, but he knew Jesus had ultimate control. He knew that Jesus could heal this man even from a long way away just by speaking. Now Jesus was amazed at the trust the centurion had. And so he turned to the crowd around him and said, I have never seen somebody even from all of God's people who has so much trust as this centurion does. The messengers who had been sent to Jesus then returned to the centurion and found the man's servant well. Jesus had healed him. The centurion was certainly right to put his trust in Jesus. The centurion trusted that Jesus was in complete control. If Jesus said it, then his servant would be better. And that's exactly what happened. Just like the centurion, we need to put our trust in Jesus that he is in complete control. Put your trust in Jesus because his words can be trusted completely. And if you put your trust in Jesus, then everything that Jesus promises will be yours. He can be trusted completely for Jesus really is in control. Okay, so we'll start over the site. Question for one. What was the name of the town that uh, Jesus went to? Just hand up and shout out. Yeah, you got it. You're right, Hannah. Go on, say it loud. Mark, you say it for her then. Capernaum, that's right. So we'll go this one here. What nationality was the centurion? What nationality was he? Right, Samuel, you were first. He was Roman, exactly right. The section here. Why did Luke say the people liked the man? So there were two reasons. If you can do both of them, that's great. But there were two things that this man had done. What were the two things? Uh, Gavin? He was a good man, yep. And there was something else he'd done. Did you catch it? Jonathan? He built the synagogue. Yeah, good. And this side over here. <laughs> uh, what couldn't the centurion control? What couldn't he control? Gene? He couldn't control because the boy was sick. His, his, or his servant was sick and he couldn't control it. Right. Back over here, your second one. Why did the servants say Jesus should help the man? Or why did the elders, the first group, why did they say that Jesus should help the man. I'm going to ask a grown-up to do this one. Bill. That's right. They said it because he's a good man. You, he deserves it. Good. These ones here. When he heard that Jesus was on his way to his friend, 
when he heard that Jesus was on his way to the house, to his house, he then sent out some friends. So the first group was the elders, the religious people. The second group was some friends. What was the message that the friends took? Slightly different. Ted. <laughs> Ivy, why don't you say it? <laughs> Yeah, that's it. He wasn't good enough for Jesus to come. Between you, you got it. Well done. He said, I'm not worthy. Just say the word and he'll be healed. Nearly done. How did Jesus feel when he heard this message from the Roman centurion? It said that he was something. Caleb. He, partly, but there was something else. It said there was a word beginning with A. Got it? Go on, Gavin, help us again. He was amazed. That's right. He was amazed that the centurion believed and trusted him as much as he did. Very good. When the man's friends got home, what did they discover? What did, what did they find out? What had happened? Go on, Jean. That the servant had been healed. Exactly. Right. Good. So what are we going to learn from, from that story this morning? Well, we're going to do two or three things here and now. And then in a, in a few minutes, um, we've got some uh, activity sheets that children, you can either go and do, not right now, you can do if you want to, or you can bring them back to your seat. But before we do that, what do we learn? We learn that Jesus is powerful. The man said, just say the word, just tell, just say to the sickness or say whatever, and, and he'll be well. So Jesus' words are powerful. Jesus can do whatever he says. He's powerful. That's the first thing. When he speaks, things have to obey him. And we look in the Bible and we find that things like the, the nature obeyed him. Wind did what he said. Sickness did what he said. He made people uh, come back to life just with his words. In fact, what we find at the beginning of the Bible when God made everything, it said, and God said, let there be light and trees and animals and those kind of things. So God's words have power, and Jesus is God, so Jesus' words are powerful. Now, we can't do that. I brought my little friend Alexa along this morning. Alexa, what's the weather forecast today? Let's see if she'll tell us. Right now in Ireland, it's 14 degrees She's clever. All right, be quiet, Alexa. Alexa, be quiet. Right. She's clever. Think that, and, and how many of you have Alexa at home? Or a similar version? Yeah. Most people these days have Alexa or Google or one of the others that you talk to, and you can ask them questions, and sometimes they'll hear questions that you haven't even asked them, have they? Our tally was on the other day, and Alexa pipped up. You know, but she doesn't know everything. She can't tell you everything, but, but God can. God knows everything, and he will help us in every situation. So that's the first thing. The second thing, Martin, can you put my on the, the, the screen here? So it just tells us that with God, all things are possible, that nothing is impossible for God. Children, young people, grown-ups, this is a really, really important thing that with God, nothing is impossible. He's got the power to do whatever needs to happen. Our trouble is that sometimes we muddle up what we want and what we need. So we think we really need this or we really want something. And sometimes it doesn't happen because we get them muddled up. So it's just a little thing. Do we need or want a place to call home? Hands up if you think that's a need. Hands up if you think it's a want. But definitely the needs have that. I think it's a need for us to be healthy, for us to be, you know, uh, emotionally balanced and all of that, we need a place to call. I think that's a pretty much a need. The latest games console, something like that. Is that a want or a need? Hands up if you think that's a need. Hands up if you think it's a want. 
Good. I'm glad all the young people, all you children said, do you think that's a want? Food, is that a need or a want? Hands up if you think that's a want. Hands up if you think it's a need. Yeah, good. Okay. Latest technology, you want a nice iPad or a, a good Samsung phone or whatever. Is that a want or a need? Hands up for a need. <laughs> You've got trouble coming on down here if she's near. <laughs> Hands up for once. Yes, of course, it's a want. We don't have to have those things. We can manage without them. Water, need or want? Need, want. <laughs> Simon says want. <laughs> a pet penguin. Don't ask me why they had a pet penguin on here, but do you think a pet penguin or a pet rabbit or a pet is a need or a want? Hands up for wants. Hands up for needs. <laughs> yeah. Well, pets are nice, but we don't actually need them, do we? But pet penguin would be cool, wouldn't it? That'd be really cool. Yeah. So we just have to keep in mind that when we go and ask Jesus for things, he knows whether we really need them or whether they're just things we want. If we really need them, he will give them to us because he can. If it's just something we want, then sometimes he will because he's, he's nice like that but sometimes he'll know that actually they're not going to be good for us and there's better things for us. The one thing we can be sure that Jesus will always do is if we ask him to forgive us for our sins, if we say sorry to him, that is the thing. We know that he will do that. He will always forgive us for our sins. He's got the authority to do that. That's why he came to earth, in order to forgive us for the things which we've done wrong so that when... In our life, God can be with us and be our friend. And when we die, that we will go to be with him in heaven. So Jesus has got authority to forgive our sins. And that's the most important thing that we can ever, ever ask him. And so at this point, we're going to pray. And I've got a list of people that we would like Jesus to do things for. This centurion had a friend who was a servant who was really ill. And we've got some people that we know that are really ill and really, well, they would like Jesus to make them better. They need Jesus to help them. And we're going to pray for them. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've got the power in a word to do anything, that nothing is impossible with you. And so we pray and lift these people to you in our prayers. Like, like the centurion, we're, we're sending word to you that uh, these people that we love are ill. Lord, you know what each of these people need and what they want. Sometimes what we want and what we need are not the same, but you know. And so we would ask that you will meet the needs of these people and that you'll supply their wants where it's going to be best for them. And Lord Jesus, we've all got things in our lives that are going on, things that trouble us, things that concern us, things that we need your help with, different situations. And we ask this morning that you'll help us in all of those things to be patient, to trust you, like that centurion trusted you, believed that you could do what he needed to happen and what he wanted. Lord, you have that power. So help us to trust you as he did. And we bring all of our prayers to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Children, um, there are the activity sheets at the back. You're welcome to go and sit at a table if you want to, or you're welcome to go and get a, a sheet and bring it back to where you are. That either of those is fine, but I would love you to listen to the next bit because Jazz is going to tell us about what Jesus means to her and what he's done for her and how he's helped her come up, Jazz. We loved it when she gave, her and Will gave their testimony the other week at a, at a prayer meeting. We said we need to hear more of this. So Jazz, do you want to hold that one? And then we'll all be out here. Lovely. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Jazz for people that don't know me. Um, I've thankfully been brought up in a Christian family um, when I was younger and I've had good Christian parents to lead and guide me through life, um, which is such a blessing. Um, but the first time I really um, thought God was real was when I was just three years old um, and I came out in something called scolded skin syndrome. 
Um, Ipswich Hospital only have one case a year, and I was that one. It's when all your skin blisters up and comes off. There was a high um, chance of me not making it, but thankfully God carried me the whole way. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and was worried as I hadn't said my prayers that night. And so I called for mum and we prayed together. And from that moment onwards, I knew that there was more to God than just going to church and saying my prayers before bed. He was actually real and he could do anything that he wanted and he could heal me and he did. Um, I then first fully came to know God when I was seven years old. And funnily enough, it was at Fressingfield Holiday Bible Club with Stephen and Cynthia Walker um, who were leading it. Um, and they were telling the story of um, Jesus dying on the cross. And I don't know if any of you remember the little felt boards that they had with the little pictures of Jesus. And I remember they had the picture of Jesus walking up to the cross and just thinking, wow, he actually did that for me. And it wasn't just for everyone else, it was for me as well. And um, yeah, from that moment, I kind of knew that, that God actually loved me. Um, so I also went to Wevering Set Camp um, when I was younger, and that's been a massive help in my Christian walk. Um, and in 2014, one of my tent leaders, Hannah, really helped me, as the one thing stopping me from being baptized was the fear of being in heaven forever, which I know sounds funny, as, the, as it's the day that I long for now, but I was scared stiff of being in the same place forever. But Hannah made it so clear that it's a place that's better than we can ever understand. Um, and asked me, would you be happy doing your favorite thing on earth forever? And I said, yes. Um, and she said that heaven's just going to be a hundred times better than that. Um, so I came back, back from camp that year wanting to be baptized, but I didn't really tell anyone um, until I went to my sister's friend's baptism. And actually it was Emma Barmer's back, baptism, um, so Stuart's daughter, um, when they were in Ipswich. And Stuart was preaching um, and was saying that um, baptism is a command from God and that if we love him, we should be doing it. Um, so I came home that night and told my mum I wanted to be baptised to find out that my sister Amelia had just asked the same thing to mum as well um, and she wanted to get baptised. So on the 30th of August 2015, we both got baptised at Stoke Ash Baptist Church. Um, but that was just the beginning of what God has done for me really. Since then I've lived a life um, that I thought God would, be, God would be happy with. I went to church every Sunday um, and yeah, going by every day, knowing that God was real, but not necessarily having a, a deep, meaningful relationship with him. Um, that was until I went through a breakup with a boy I'd been with for five years after discovering he'd been keeping a lot of secrets um, and things hidden from me. At the time, it completely broke me, um, and I was holding out for him to change so that I could get back with him, but I just kept getting heartbreak after heartbreak, and my, I wanted my life to go back to the happy life that it was before. This went on for about six months, six months of crying myself to sleep and feeling so lost until one afternoon I was sat on my bedroom floor reading my Bible, just crying, but feeling these arms wrapped around me so tight and, and I can't explain it, but I felt like he was there in the room with me. Um, and I knew at that moment I wasn't alone. I clearly put my boyfriend above Jesus and thought he'd never fail me, which is why I was so heartbroken because human beings are flawed and they can't satisfy you like Jesus ever can. Um, I then realized I'd grown so much in my faith and realized that we're not called to just live that happy life that I wanted, but we're called to live a life of service to him. Um, I learned that humans leave you and let you down, but Jesus will be with you constantly and he can give you a love that, and a joy that I can't explain. I was then led to go to Zambia that next summer on a mission trip where I learned so much and met so many amazing people and I finally felt full again. So since then, a, then and now a lot has happened. I met Will and we got engaged um, and then very much struggled to find a house. Um, and we didn't really know where God wanted us church wise, um, but he provided our home to us. Um, even if we didn't get the keys a week before the wedding, um, we still got it in God's timing. Um, we got married um, and then was clearly told that we should be at Fressingfield. So that's kind of where we've ended up and where I am now. Hey, <laughs> it's lovely. Yeah, thanks guys, brilliant. I think that's super. If you want to know more about that, or, or you identify with some of the things that she's been through and she's described and, and how God helped her, have a word with her and you pray together and I'm sure she'd want to encourage you with that. Young people, come and lead us in our next song and then we'll just have a few minutes as we finish just drawing out a couple of other things from this story. Come on, come up and lead us because you're going to, we're going to sing Light of the World. You step down into darkness. John 8, verse 12. Later, Jesus talked to the people again, who said, I am the light of the world. The person who follows me will never live in darkness, 
he will have the light that gives life. So I just want to draw out two very simple uh, other applications from this story for us this morning. Um, I want to think about the way this uh, the centurion approached Jesus, or the way some of the people approached Jesus. The first one is uh, the wrong approach. So the wrong approach. And that was, you may have picked it up, you probably did if you've been around church for very long, the elders who went to Jesus with the message from the army commander, they take the message, uh, rather than simply say, would you come and heal this man's servant, they decide to elaborate on it. And it's come and heal him, because he deserves it. Well, the, the message they were meant to take was simply come, come, and, come and heal him. 
which is a great statement of faith that we see in this man. But they, they elaborate on it as the Jewish leaders tended to do. They elaborated on it and it was, come and do this because he deserves it. Come and do it. He's a good man. Come and do it because he's invested heavily and he's built this wonderful temp tabernacle, this synagogue, all rest. He deserves it. We might call that the L'Oreal approach. Because you're worth it. Because he's worth it. A lot of people are like that, you know, when it comes to, to God. Without really thinking about it, without realizing it. They think that God will do something because they deserve it or because somebody else deserves it when they pray and and if we're not careful, those of us who are followers of Jesus, we can slip into it. We say, Lord, would you do this because this person has done this, this person has done that, and, 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 and we, we add to it. And Jesus was very clear on this, that when we come to him, we don't come, we don't, can't ask him, we can't bargain with him on the basis that there's anything in us or in other people that, that deserves it. He was so sure about it, and he's so firm about it. He told a story one day, a story we call a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, about a, a, a religious man and somebody that was depicted as probably being the worst of the worst, a tax man. We haven't got any tax people, tax inspectors in this morning, have we? Well, Jesus told this story about the religious, upright man and the, the dodgy tax man, and they, he, in the story, he pictures them both going into the, into the temple, and they pray. And you read about it in, in Luke 18. And the, the, the religious man prays, standing near the front, and he puts his hands out. Oh, God, I'm, I'm so grateful that I'm not like him. Lord, you know that I give well. Lord, you know I... I, I give a bit of everything that I have, even down to the, even down to the herbs that I grow. You know, I'm, I'm that meticulous in what I do. And, and God, I'm, I'm so thankful for what I am. And I'm, you ought to be glad that, well, he didn't say this, but this was in effect what he was saying. You know, you, you're honoured to have me as, as your friend. Meanwhile, the other bloke, the dodgy chap, tax man, he's at the back and he doesn't even dare to look up. You know, the Jewish way of praying was like that. That was how Jews normally prayed. But this, this tax collector guy says that he wouldn't even lift his eyes up. And he's looking down. And, and in the story, Jesus has him praying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said it was the, the one who prayed about having mercy on him, that was accepted by God, who went away forgiven, not the one who went in, so proud of all that he'd done. There's a right and a wrong way to approach God. I've said it before, say it many times, I don't do many funerals of atheists, because when I talk to the family, of, and, and I'm talking now about funerals of people who haven't been to church, invariably I'll talk to them beforehand to find out about the person, and nearly always they'll say to me, no, he didn't go to church, or she didn't go to church, but they were a good person, you know. Yeah, they, 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 weren't, they weren't saints, but they, they weren't really bad either. And, and I'm sure he's gone to a better place. And every time they think they've gone to a better place, and, and they'll talk to me about what they did and how kind they were and how generous and, and all of that, despite the fact that, any, and I'm meant to be telling this lot, to, you know, all of this stuff to, in, the, in, the, in the service. And I, and I will, because, you, you know, it doesn't mean that a person isn't good, does it? You know, just because they've not been perfect. And you can say justifiably, this person did that, and they, they did this, and they did that. But what we can't say is because they've done those things, they've gone to heaven we don't get to heaven by being good we get to heaven by trusting Jesus to deal with our sins we get to heaven we get forgiven by God by like the, the 
the dodgy tax collector saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. Please, will you forgive me? So that's the wrong way. Interestingly, you might have thought in the light, or we might have thought, that in the light of him getting, or those men getting the question so wrong, you know, he deserves it, come and make him better, that Jesus would sort of stop and put them right. You know, well, no, it's, it's not how it works. Like, guys, you've got to get it, you've got to understand, I don't do it because whatever, but he doesn't. The, if you read the story in the New International Version in Luke 7, it says, so Jesus went with them. It's actually a poor translation. A better translation is nevertheless Jesus went with them. In other words, despite the fact that they got it so wrong, he still went. That says something about the heart of Jesus, doesn't it? Tells us something about the kindness and the, and the, the, the understanding of Jesus. He went along. Why? I, because he saw the faith that was going on in the centurion and not the mistake that the messengers that he'd sent had made. And so we come to the, the right approach. Because as Jesus is on the journey, the centurion sends out a second lot of messengers. The first lot were religious, the elders, religious guys. The second lot, it says that he sent out his friends. He sent his friends. And they went with a message. And, and their message was, was quite simple. Just, just say the word. Just say the word. And they, they said exactly as, them, as the centurion had said, I'm not worthy to come for, for you to come into my house. I don't deserve it. You're a holy man and, and, and great and mighty. I don't deserve it. Just say, just say the word and my servant will be healed. Here's a man himself under authority. He was a man who was used to giving orders, but he was a, he was a, a Gentile. That means he wasn't one of the people that you would naturally associate as being uh, someone that God would be interested in. In those days, the idea was, the understanding was that God, Jesus, would really only be interested in the Jews, the people that God had worked with for many centuries. But this man is a Roman. So you, the understanding, common understanding, would be that Jesus wouldn't be interested in him because he wasn't one of the select group. He didn't meet the criteria. He's an outsider. And yet the thing that Jesus marveled at was this outsider got the whole thing of how to get right with God, whereas the insiders didn't. The Jews, represented here by the elders, said, he's worth it. This centurion said, I'm not worth it. I don't deserve it. This man understood more than about Jesus, more than all of the Jewish insiders put together. He recognized that he was in the presence of greatness. He recognized that he was in the presence of one who was mighty. There were three, three things, <clears throat> and just go through these three things with you that, that we can draw out from this passage here, the way he did it. He recognized that he didn't deserve Jesus' help. He didn't deserve Jesus' help. He, he got that Jesus was far greater than himself. He didn't presume to ask him to come to my house, to his house. He was the same as the, the, the dodgy tax collector in the temple. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That was his heart. There was a humility about him. He had a right understanding of Jesus. He had a right understanding of himself. It's important that we do too. Because the truth is that none of us deserve, we've all offended God. None of us, as good as we might be, as hardworking as we might be, as much as we might give, as loyal as we might be, none of us deserve the favor of God. So we have to, we have to come in the same way. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That was the first thing he got right. He knew he didn't deserve it. He also understood that Jesus could do anything. You just say the word and it'll happen. He believed without a doubt that Jesus had got the authority to heal his servant. 
There was no question in his mind that the servant might be too ill or that the disease might have gone too far for him to be healed. Whatever the problem, if Jesus gave the word, the illness would have to go. And of course, he was right, wasn't he? Jesus does have that authority. He's God in the flesh. Before he left, he said to his disciples, all authority is given to me. And he demonstrated that when he was, when he was alive on earth. The things he did, they were his calling card. They were his credentials showing that nothing was too hard. And so when we come to that thing that we said earlier on, the most important thing for us is to have forgiveness of sins. The, the most important thing is not for us to be made well, the most important thing is for us to be forgiven and be made right with God, reconciled to God. We need to understand, and this is the good news, that no one is too bad for Jesus to do that for. No one is too far gone. No one is, has forgotten. No one has done things too bad that Jesus can forgive them. That's a wonderful message we have to tell people, isn't it? It's a wonderful message this week. If you talk to some of your neighbors and your friends or people in your family, don't give up on them. No one is too bad. And they might need to know, they might need you to tell them, you're not too bad for Jesus. He still loves you, he still cares for you, and he can still forgive you. It's a wonderful message. And for all I know, some of you might have come in here this morning and thought, I'm just, I'm just too bad. I've messed up again. I've let him down. He, I don't deserve it. No, you don't but you're not too bad for the love and the grace and the kindness and the mercy of God. And if you've come in this morning, you're thinking, I don't deserve it, I'm too bad, then you come to him. Come to him today. If you've never come to him before, you come to him because he wants to forgive you. He wants to give you this wonderful eternal life. He wants to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit to empower you and to help you get through life. And he wants to give you eternal life with him at the end. So those are the first two things. He didn't deserve the help, that Jesus can do anything. And he also realized that Jesus could do anything, anytime, anywhere. You don't even need to come to my house. You don't need to touch him. You don't need to be there. You just say the word and he will be well. Just say the word. Jesus' response is that he's amazed that this guy, this, this non-Jewish non-religious person understood this. You know, we, we need to get this as well. We don't have to be anywhere. We don't have to do anything special to get Jesus to answer our prayers. We can pray wherever we are. It's good to come to church. It's lovely to do this together. You know, we sing together and we get to hear God speak to us together from his word as we read it and as we do this bit, it's good to hear testimonies like jazz. It's great to have a cup of coffee afterwards and just sit and natter and chat to each other and encourage each other and know it. It's great, isn't it? But we don't have to be here to do those things. We don't have to be here. This is not the only place that we can pray to God. God doesn't live in this place. God doesn't live here. I know we talk about God's house but so I think we think that it's God's house in as much as we come here to meet with him. God doesn't live here. God lives everywhere. We can meet with him anywhere. And whenever we talk to him, wherever we are, he can hear us. And he will hear us. And he will answer our prayers. So don't get caught up with the religious stuff that you have to do things in a certain way. It's your heart that he's after. It's your heart and your attitude that he, he looks at. The small, I, I trust that none of us make the mistake of the Jews thinking that we're worth it. None of us are worth it, but he loves us the same. So let's come, let's live, let's walk, let's serve humbly with him. And if you're, if you're someone who's here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus and you're thinking he wouldn't want somebody like me, I, I don't deserve it. I'll say to you, no, you don't, but he loves you and he wants you to come to know him as well. He wants to forgive you. He wants to adopt you into his family. That's the way he is. And we're all the same. I think as Christians, sometimes we need this little reminder as well, don't we? You know, sometimes we can think we don't deserve it. We've messed up again. And the older we get, I really ought to have overcome this thing by now. I really ought to have stopped doing or saying or thinking or whatever. 
how can he how can I pray when blah blah blah? I see he's just so gracious, isn't he? He's just so kind, he's so good. He said, Come to me. None of us are too bad. And maybe this morning he'd just say to you, You're a Christian, you feel you've mucked up. Yes, you might have done, but come back to me. Confess it. Say you're sorry. Come back and enjoy that fellowship, that friendship with him again. Trust him. Believe him. That's all he asks. Young people, come back up. Lead us in our last song. As you do that, I'm going to pray. So you be coming up, and I'm going to lead us just in a prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for your power, that nothing's impossible with you. We thank you for this, what we learned this morning from uh, this centurion. Uh, we thank you that although we don't deserve your favor, you still, when we come to you, you're still willing to give to us. You're still willing to hear our prayers. We love you. We thank you. Help us to serve you well. Help us to love you. Help us to live humbly. And help us to be so full of your love for other people that we would want to tell them about you as well. In your name we ask it. Amen. Over to you guys. Lord Jesus, you are the one who's worthy. 
you have given your life, you laid down your life for us, and we thank you for that. But we can't help but say thank you for these young people this morning, these young people that you've given to us as a church, and we want to ask your blessing upon them as they, as they grow, would they come to know you and enjoy you and experience you and continue to serve you. Bless their families. Bless us as your people. And go with us as we leave this place now. And would, you, would we meet with you again tonight? Would you speak to us? Would you help us to understand this wonderful message that is of Jesus as we look at Hope Explored? So come, we ask our Father by the Spirit tonight, and speak to us as we look at that. Now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of you today and always. Amen.